What is going on? Welcome to Aged and Barreled. Today, we're gonna to be discussing everything barrel related. This video is dedicated to the cask. This is meant to be a comprehensive overview, somewhere in between an intro and a masterclass. Casks, or barrels as they're referred to in the US, play a huge role in the flavors you taste in a whiskey, and they're also a vital part in the whiskey making process. I'm gonna go through some history and lore surrounding casks, all the main components that make up a cask, typical and some obscure types of barrels used in the aging and finishing process, and much more. So let's get right into it. So first of all, what's the difference between a barrel and a cask? Generally speaking, they can be used interchangeably, typically referring to a cask in Europe and a barrel in North America. Technically speaking, however, there is a difference. America's barrels are set standard 53 gallons or 200 liters. Casks are a more generic term for a number of different wooden storage containers. Believe it or not, whiskey wasn't always aged in wooden containers the way it is today. Prior to the 1800s, scotch typically wasn't aged, and across the ocean in America, it wasn't until the late 1700s that charred barrels were being used. Before then, most whiskey was consumed unaged. This actually makes a lot of sense. Whiskey was very hard to transport, and the vast international market we have today was non-existent. Also, aging whiskey is very expensive. Why tie up all that inventory when you can sell it right away? Many theories suggest that whiskey aging happened by accident. Once it became possible and affordable enough, shipping whiskey long distances changed the product. Over time, people became accustomed to this new flavor and it slowly took over. Another less romantic theory is that it was borrowed from the French, who had already been aging cognac in barrels for some time. One of my favorite theories as to who started charring bourbon barrels deals with Kentucky pastor Elijah Craig. As the story goes, in 1789, Elijah Craig caught his barrels on fire by accident. Instead of scrapping the barrels, he tried to use them, and the rest is history. More than likely, this is a bit of a fairy tale. Realistically, to save time and money, barrels were repurposed and cleaned out, scorching the inside of the barrels that previously held goods with less desirable flavors, such as fish, meat, and vegetables. Once maturing whiskey in barrels had caught on, back in Scotland, the need for cheap casks grew. An abundance of used wine casks from Europe and eventually bourbon barrels from the United States filled the scotch need perfectly. Since bourbon barrels today can only be used once to make bourbon, the surplus is a no-brainer for aging scotch. Before we get into how casks are made, it's important to know the main pieces that make up a cask. First and foremost, there are the staves, roughly 30 or so thin curved wooden planks. The gaps between each stave are known as the joints. Holding the staves together are a set of metal hoops riveted tightly together into rings. Everyone's favorite, the bunghole and bung plug, are found within one of the wider staves in the bilge, or the widest part of the cask. Finally, wooden lids known as the heads are pushed snugly into place on each end of the cask. There are a few more technical terms such as chime and crows, but these are the main important pieces. So how does one go about making a new cask? First, wood is cut into planks. These planks are then dried either outside for months or in a kiln to save time. The planks are then shaved into staves and planed to get a slight curve. The staves are then assembled into a barrel shape held together with temporary hoops and steamed to make the wood more pliable. Permanent hoops are then put onto the casks where they are toasted or charred on the inside. Once charred, more hoops and the heads are put into place. A bunghole is drilled and finally whiskey is filled. Casks come in a variety of different sizes. A larger cask is able to mature more whiskey at once but its increased volume means less surface area contact for the whiskey. This reduced contact leads to less overall cask influence on the whiskey. On the flip side, a very small cask imparts more potent cask flavors into the whiskey. There are several somewhat standardized sizes distilleries use. Keep in mind these are not all cask sizes available, just the more common ones and the volumes per cask change depending on who you ask. Working our way from smallest to largest, we have the pin, firkin, quarter cask, barrel, hogshead, sherry butt, puncheon, port pipe, Madeira drum, and gorda. Two key elements that drastically influence the whiskey are the type of wood and previous contents of the cask. By far the most common wood used is oak, be it American, European, or Japanese Mizunara. There are also a few rare expressions matured or finished in cherry and chestnut instead of oak. The previous contents of the cask are just as important be it new wood, bourbon, sherry, either manzanilla, Pedro Jimenez, or Oloroso, 
Madeira, port, sauterne, wine, rum, even beer and tequila can be used. Now that we have the array of maturing tools at our disposal, are distilleries allowed to mix and match variations as they see fit? The answer actually depends on where. Laws and regulations determine what can be used where. For simplicity's sake, virtually all casks must be at or below 700 liters. All scotch must be matured in oak. All American whiskey must be aged in charred new oak, with the exception of light and corn whiskey. Canada, Ireland, and Japan have no specification for the type of wood. Returning to Scotland, casks also cannot have previously held stone fruits, meaning peaches, plums, cherries, etc. And they just recently allowed the use of tequila casks. All right, that's gonna wrap up this video. I hope you enjoyed it, maybe learned something new. If you did, please leave a like, leave a comment, hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, cheers.